Hello, everybody, and welcome to the third in a series of webinars on transportation electrification for the electric company industry. My name is Nick Nigro from Atlas Public Policy, and along with Ed Kerr from CMK Consulting, we've been hosting the series for you over the last several months as part of a joint effort by the U.S. Department of Energy and Edison Electric Institute to collaborate on transportation electrification. After our last webinar, we put out a survey to all the webinar participants to see what would be the most valuable direction to take the series. And the results are in. And in this webinar, we're going to be focusing on the ratepayer benefits of EVs on the electrical grid. We've asked Marcus Alexander from the Electric Power Research Institute to do a deep dive into a model he helped develop at EPRI that evaluates the high level benefits of greater transportation electrification. We've also reserved a lot of time for discussion following Marcus's presentation. So <clears throat> as I mentioned, the webinar series is a joint effort by EEI and DOE. Uh, we've done two webinars so far. Uh, we've covered why electric companies should engage in transportation electrification and also what are the different transportation markets that can help and what helps make them succeed. All the content for both webinars, including the slides and the recording of the webinars, are available at atlaspolicy.com. Uh, and so, as I mentioned, based on feedback from everyone, the third webinar will be focused on the ratepayer benefits of utility investment. Uh, special thanks, of course, to the Clean Cities Program at the U.S. Department of Energy and EEI for supporting this initiative. So what are we going to do today? First, we're going to set the scene. Ed is going to take care of that. And then we'll turn things over to Marcus at EPRI to, to give a presentation on the economic value of transportation electrification. And just as I mentioned, we'll have a facilitated Q&A with audience, particip audience participation later on uh, at, in the latter third of the webinar. So before I turn it over to Ed, I just want to have a few notes about logistics. First, if you have any technical issues, please send us an email to at info at atlaspolicy.com. That's info at atlaspolicy.com, and we can try to help troubleshoot in real time. Uh, we're using Skype for Business as a platform to host this series. For those of you unfamiliar with the software, you can run it on any computer or mobile device. We highly recommend viewing the meeting in presentation view so you can see the slides more easily. You could choose the meeting view by clicking on the icon in the upper right corner of the window called Pick a Layout. We have a very large group online, so we don't, we won't be able to unmute all the phone lines or use Skype's familiar video chat at the outset of the meeting. However, at some point, we're going to try something new, in part because of the feedback we received from you all and on the importance of having a dialogue. So we have a lot of people on the line. I'm counting well over 50 at this point. Uh, so we're going to ask for your cooperation. If you're connected to the meeting on your phone, we we can't unmute you. Only you can do it. And you can do so by pressing star six on your phone. That's star six on your phone, and that will unmute you. You can also press star one to hear all commands. If you're connected to the computer, you can unmute your line by clicking the microphone icon. We'll be using Skype's Q&A feature to make it easy for you to share your questions with Marcus, Ed, and me throughout the meeting. Uh, so we can queue up questions, perhaps answer some of them in real time, depending on how things go. You can access the Q&A feature by clicking on the tab at the bottom of the screen labeled Q&A. You can go back to the slides by clicking the Content Stage tab if you're using the web app or the Presentation tab if you're using the Skype for Business desktop app. If you're having any trouble with your computer or mobile app at any time, you can dial into the audio service to connect to the meeting by phone. Your meeting invitation should include the phone number and passcode. One final note, we are recording this webinar as we've done with the others in this series, and we'll post the, a video online with, along with the slides within a few days. Uh, so just to recap, we, we want to have a more engaging dialogue with folks. And so as long as you're connected to the computer and you'd like to speak up and, and, and unmute your line, just send us a note through that Q&A feature, uh, and, and we'll, give it, we'll try to facilitate the dialogue recognizing that we have over 50 folks on the call. So again, just try to send a note before you try to unmute yourself through the Q&A feature. And now I'd like to turn it over to Ed. To, to Ed, take it away. All right. <clears throat> Thanks, Nick. Uh, hopefully everybody can hear me. Nick, you can hear me, right? Yep, you're good. All right. Excellent. So uh, good morning, everybody. Good morning for folks on the left side of the country and good afternoon for folks on the right hand side of the country, depending on whether you're facing up or down. 
coming from New Zealand, I tend to face down. Um, so, listen, I think before we get going and, and turn over the uh, webinar to uh, Marcus at EPRI, I did want to just reiterate a couple of things from uh, the ground that we've covered over the last uh, five or six months together. Um, and as Nick says, all of this content uh, is available uh, at um, uh, Atlas's website. Really encourage you to download the material, use the material, and I also encourage you to continue to uh, reach out to Nick, myself, and uh, Becky at uh, Edison Electric Institute. You know, we've had some really good conversations with folks, and I think it's important that we keep this dialogue going and basically learn from each other's experiences. So, you know, over the last uh, handful of months, we've covered, as I said, a lot of ground. We've talked a lot about uh, the changing utility attitudes um, around electric vehicles and how electric vehicles uh, sort of operate with storage, with grid modernization, with bi-directional energy, uh, and with renewables deployment. And I think that changing utility attitude is really uh, uh, encapsulated quite nicely with the Utility Dives Executive Survey for 2016. We talked about that in uh, the first webinar and really encourage you to use that uh, in your internal discussions with, um, with uh, your various stakeholders. We've talked a lot about the tools that are available uh, to help electric companies around the country uh, develop and uh, operate their electric vehicle programs. And frankly, uh, those tools are available for um, you know all stakeholders, uh, whether it be cities, local governments, etc. And uh, the DOE EV Everywhere campaign um, has uh, a rich supply of tools that can be used. And then uh, for electric companies, the EEI uh, programs and pledges uh, and tools that are available through EEI are, are really good as well. And again, it's about not necessarily reinventing the wheel, but basically use material and resources that are available to get you uh, going in your markets. We've talked about what helps make those markets succeed. And uh, there's certainly uh, some good data now. And I think that's really uh, the theme of today is about data and understanding about how um, electric vehicles interact with the grid. You don't have to invent stuff. There's a lot of material now that is being developed and that has already been developed that can be used in our individual markets. Um, we've talked about some case studies. You know, again, stand on the shoulders of those that have gone before you. Um, you will find, I think, uh, a willing uh, partnership with utilities that have been very proactive in the marketplace and really encourage you to reach out to those um, subject matter experts with those um, electric companies because they willingly uh, want to help. Um, lots of studies. And I'm going to talk about uh, a couple of new ones today that you may or may not have seen, but I think they really help to amplify what Marcus is going to be talking about um, with the EPRI uh, work around the value and grid benefits of uh, electric vehicles for all ratepayers. And I'll talk about those in a second. Um, and then, uh, you know, again, I think just to reiterate, really encourage your uh, engagement today. Um, we want this to be a dialogue, not a monologue. Um, and the more you put in, the more you get out. Uh, and also, if uh, you want to follow up with us, I uh, encourage you to reach out to Nick. He can certainly get questions uh, and requests uh, to us, whether it be to Marcus, whether it be to myself, or uh, Becky at EEI, I really encourage you to um, you know funnel that uh, through uh, through Nick. All right, Nick, if we go to uh, the next slide. Go ahead, Ed. It, it's showing. It should be. Uh, yeah, it's not on mine. All right, I'll advance it on mine. I um, see. It. 
Yeah, you're, you might be looking at your own personal view, Ed, but go ahead. It's showing. Okay. All right. So um, uh, the first slide that I want to talk about should be the Rocky Mountain Institute EV report. Is that right, Nick? Yes. Okay. So I think what's uh, good about this report um, is, you know, these two columns really capture, I think, really well, um, you know, basically bookends of electric company engagement. So on the one hand, you can be very proactive in the marketplace. And on the other hand, you can wait for the market to come to you. And I think there are implications between these two actions. I'm not going to go through the list, but I really encourage you to look at this list and to uh, really think about the implications of um, uh, of either being proactive or holding back and uh, waiting for the market to come to you. Um, you know, the the point in all of this is, I think, when you look at uh, this, can you press the next um, uh, slide, Nick? It should be the, the bubble that comes yep. up. Yeah. All right. When you look at that, uh, that sort of uh, bookends of being proactive or waiting for the market to come to you, think about the implications of those actions. We are um, about to see, I believe, some significant um, catalyst of change happening in the marketplace, uh, particularly around the issue of the VW settlement. And we've talked a bit about that in the past, but basically $2 billion of EV infrastructure is going to be deployed in key markets around the country uh, over the next 10 years. It's, it's not going to be spread like peanut butter. It's going to be definitely focused in the markets that are proactive, the markets that are well organized and really want to uh, accelerate transportation electrification, um, as well as uh, the $2.7 billion, which is the Emissions Mitigation Fund. Um, now, those funds will be going direct to the states. And they, and at least 15% of that money can also be used for EV infrastructure deployment. So you're looking at a pretty significant uh, uptick of uh, uh, charging infrastructure that are going into the markets. I think the other point to be thinking about as we think about the context of all this is the growing um, plug-in vehicle introductions. You know, we've got uh, Model 3 from Tesla that we're coming online, the Bolt coming online, the Volt, second generation Volt, which is now already in the market. Uh, you've got the Toyota Prius now coming online. So, and then you've got the next generation Leaf around the corner. So you're seeing some pretty major uh, investments that are being made. We covered that in, I think, uh, one of the previous uh, webinars. Pretty major investments now uh, by automakers uh, that are going to help accelerate the market. And then I think the, the final point, and again, as we think about this in context of am I proactive or am I just simply waiting for the market to happen, is uh, this propensity for higher and higher power charging and the implications that that will have on the electrical system. We're seeing it with buses. Uh, we're seeing it with obviously light duty passenger vehicles. So I think that you're going to see a lot of growth with uh, high power charging in the future. All right, next slide. Um, so uh, NRAIL have also done uh, a lot of work in this space and what I looked at, uh, again, with the lens of this rate payer benefit or this value to all um, utility or electric company customers, they have done a, a number of uh, scenario uh, planning work around PVs, the grid, and renewables integration. And basically, you know, in, in most cases, um, the scenarios that they've explored they've really concluded that um, transformers can handle this load, that the grid is um, adapting kind of faster than the load from transportation that's hitting it, and that this excess capacity, this opportunity that's being created by the excess capacity um, that is a result of the rise of uh, energy efficiency and 
renewables, self-generating uh, renewables from customers, that this, this opportunity for transportation to connect to the grid um, with relatively low additional infrastructure investment in the grid is um, a quite unique in terms of uh, the electric company industry. And so we really don't want to let this opportunity pass us by. And then I think uh, in most of those usage scenarios, that, that, that they're really concluded that this benefits the grid. Transportation electrification benefits the grid and ergo it benefits uh, all the customers. All right, next slide. Um, <clears throat> Black and Veatch, we're all, uh, I think, pretty familiar with these folks. Uh, they've been doing a uh, strategic directions report um, for the utility industry over the last decade. And um, I think what's interesting about uh, that report is that uh, increasingly they are seeing um, uh, a lot of uh, utility interest in uh, electric vehicles. And it's, a, a lot of it is centered around the load growth opportunities from electric vehicles or how that load can offset the kind of implications of declining utilization in the system. And you can see here uh, the results of uh, the last uh, online survey, which was conducted, I believe, about uh, May, June, July of this year. So it's pretty recent data. Uh, but again, uh, new load or that replacing departing load, uh, how it can help with renewables integration in those markets that are really driving uh, for more renewables, and then how it integrates uh, around uh, grid service opportunities. All right, next slide. Um, does your organization support the adoption of any of the following EV programs? This is kind of interesting where there's a lot of support around workplace charging, I think for obvious reasons. That's the other eight hours a day that the car is connected, and the value of shaping that load or the value of um, uh, uh, ancillary services, or even in the future, the value potentially of bi-directional. Uh, utilities uh, around the country are really beginning to see this and wanting to uh, uh, unlock that value for uh, all customers. Um, is your organization examining or studying the regulatory environment? I think we're going to talk quite a bit today about, um, you know, how, uh, how folks are engaging in the regulatory environment and, and some of the challenges around lack of awareness or understanding on behalf of the regulators around the value of uh, electric vehicles and then the role that um, electric companies might play. But certainly you can see that there's a good percentage of electric companies now that are really looking at this issue from the regulatory perspective um, with the view of uh, future uh, business opportunities. Okay, um, so with that as kind of the, the scene, setting the scene, what I wanna do is uh, turn it over to Marcus now and uh, he can uh, explain the work that uh, EPRI has been doing. I think what's important in all of this is uh, the this, this subject matter can get dry very quickly. So, um, you know, hang in there, uh, really encourage uh, questions uh, and dialogue. Um, but uh, we've got, you know, a, a good bit to get through, but we've also provided a lot of time for discussion, and I think uh, that's what we really want to encourage is that uh, discussion. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Marcus. Hello, can everyone hear me? Can hear you fine, buddy. Great. Um, yeah, and also, uh, you know, as we go along, um, if, if you have questions, uh, feel free to enter them into the um, Skype Q&A. Um, Facility, I can't actually see that, but Nick can. <laughs> and if, I guess if you uh, um, also can't see that, go ahead and um, send a, the, it, the Skype has a, an IM function as well. So if you send that to Nick or myself, we can also answer that way. 
Um, so the study or I'd like to talk about is the uh, rate payer benefit of transportation electrification. Um, it's actually, <laughs> made a mistake, it's actually December, not November. Um, it, you know, in terms of this study, um, you know, why did we do it? Uh, the bottom line is uh, transportation electrification um, could be a big benefit to electric companies and to all rate payers. And actually, um, you know, I've heard various utility executives say that this is potentially uh, the best opportunity out of um, you know all of the you know programs that are that are apparent today for um, beneficially increasing load and and while well, providing benefits to all ratepayers. Um, utilities can have a role in, in facilitating the market um, and amplifying these benefits. Uh, and so, uh, an initial step in in doing that or in, or in thinking about um, what utilities could do is is basically figuring out if this is worth it. Um, you know, what, what aspects of this are um, helpful to utilities and what aspects could be harmful. Um, in terms of what utilities could do, um, measures could range from basic customer education to um, facilitating the grid connections um, and in, in some cases, in, uh, rate basing infrastructure. Um, in this study, we're not, we're not really, or, or in the cases I'll cover, we're not really talking about um, what the utility is doing. We're more saying what what's you know what's the gap? How much um, uh, you know potential is there for for this to take off? Um, it's also worth noting that this is not about trying to allocate ratepayer dollars to a vehicle sale, um, as we'll talk about towards the end. Uh, you know this is something that um, we're interested in moving towards next. But in this case, th there essentially isn't isn't feedback where um, you know a dollar spent is is causing more vehicle sales. Um, this is this is more about what the effect is going to be, um, you know, essentially uh, w without um, a program. In terms of how the utility should use this model, um, so uh, in in general with this modeling, um, we try to uh, facilitate two ways of looking at this. Um, one of those is basically a high level um, look that doesn't really require much um, data input from utilities. And so the idea here is that um, we can kind of do a quick uh, model to basically say, okay, here's, you know, here's approximately, um, you know, what what these numbers look like based on, um, you know, what our, our current understanding of, of of the various costs. Um, but if we can get um, additional data from from electric companies, um, we can provide more detailed results. And um, it, it's, you know, the 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 and the end goal of all of this, of course, is to uh, potentially design programs uh, that, that could go to regulators, although that's not, um, you know, that, that would require a, a deeper level of involvement than just a, you know, surface level. Um, in terms of what we're covering today, um, I'll provide an overview of the uh, analysis. Um, I'll talk briefly about the total resource cost test and the rate pair. Uh, measure test. So these are the tests that were used to um, uh, essentially analyze costs, and they're they're essentially standardized um, uh, utility tests, or, or let's say regulatory cost tests. Um, I'll talk about the methodology, and then the results from um, two sets of scenarios. So one of them compares um, the effect of charging location, and then the other one uh, compares the effects of higher and lower gasoline prices. And I'll uh, finish with a summary. Um, so starting with the background, uh, I think it's important in, in talking about um, uh, transportation electrification to, to note that um, uh, you know we're, we're still at an early stage in the market, but we're at a, we're at a promising stage. So in about October, we crossed uh, a half million vehicles in the US, uh, a half million, sorry, plug-in electric vehicles in the US. And um, the, the trajectory is looking quite promising for uh, further increases. So we're, we're finally, after, after many years of uh, kind of bouncing, bouncing around below the number, we're finally at about 1% um, of vehicle sales. And there is a number of recent uh, vehicle introductions that, that Ed talked about that um, uh, you know, should help lead to higher sales in the next um, couple months. Um, and then uh, looking forward, uh, not only do we have those those vehicles that have that have just come out, um, there's also uh, you know a very promising pipeline of um, 
of new vehicles in, and especially vehicles in new classes. Like we finally have a, a plug-in electric minivan available. Um, and we have uh, an, a large number of um, uh, increased range electric vehicles coming out right now. Uh, so in general, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I guess I'm uh, optimistic about this, this market in general, but I think we're at a real um, inflection point in terms of the number of uh, vehicles. So, um, you know, Ed, Ed was talking about the peanut butter analogy or, you know, <laughs> um, uh, you know it, our investments uh, spread thinly across the U.S. And, and, you know, the investments are not, but also vehicle sales right now are not spread evenly across the U.S. So some markets like um, California are, are over 5% um, PUV sales and have been for a while. Um, some areas have significantly lower um, sales. And so that, um, you know, definitely contributes to, to the perspective of, of electric companies in those different areas. So, um, you know, the scope of what's, what's necessary and what's possible is going to change. But overall, um, you know, we're, we're very optimistic about the next couple of years for um, PUV deployment. In terms of the model used in this analysis, um, this work was originally based on a model um, developed by A3 to, to analyze the California market. Um, and this was used um, uh, by the utilities or by the electric companies in California to um, uh, look at costs of programs that they proposed. What we wanted to do was extend this model um, to other utilities across the country. We ended up with a, a final set of um, three companies that were discussed in the full study. So one is a mid-sized Southwest electric company. Um, and then there's a large Midwest and a mid-sized Midwest electric companies. Um, and, you know, it was important to us to have a model that would work across the country. Uh, you know, as we look at the, the situations that different electric companies face, um, you know, there, there's significant differences uh, between um, you know, what's possible, what's considered in scope for, for different um, electric companies. And so um, a big element of this was just basically being flexible enough to cover um, a very wide range of circumstances. Uh, and so um, in looking at the implications of these um, uh, tests, uh, we're going to cover, you know, essentially four cases, but uh, kind of two, three-ish cases. So one, one big case is um, home dominant charging. Um, another is away from home um, dominant charging. And then um, we look at a variation in fuel prices from uh, high to low. And uh, so um, in general with this model, uh, you know, th th this is not, uh, this is a, <laughs> a journey, not a destination. Um, we're, you know, constantly refining this model um, based on uh, input and, and based on the, the different situations we face in, in, in analyzing um, different areas. Um, but, you know, as I was saying towards the beginning, our focus is on trying to make something that's, uh, that allows us to um, provide basic results quickly, um, but do deep dives uh, when, when necessary and possible. And it's worth noting that the big, the big constraint here um, on, you know, just doing a deep dive is basically that um, that, you know, all, all of these models or everything, you know, related to this area um, is, it, you know, really involves um, some sensitive cost calculations um, relative to, you know, what, what the, you know, what e the situation that each um, electric company is facing. And so what that means is that it's often very difficult to get the data that's, that's necessary and, you know, to get it in a, in a form that, um, you know, that, that we're comfortable pre presenting analysis to, you know, uh, executives and, um, other stakeholders. Um, in terms of the methodology, um, you know, it, it's uh, <laughs> relatively simple, but um, you know, as, as I was saying, also um, it's it complex if you're if you're really digging in. But the basics are to um, collect data on fuel prices, and um, as I'll uh, discuss in a bit. Um, the fuel prices end up being important for the TRC test in particular. Um, it, it's this is one of those uh, things that uh, you know I wish I had a wish I had a better uh, better statement on in some ways, but basically they they end up being important to the um, uh, to the to the economics and the prospects of electric vehicles. But there's something that electric companies have very little control over, and really that I would say you know. <laughs> 
in, in you know looking through the news each day, um, you know, we really have low control over or no control over and very little knowledge of, um, depending on, on um, you know, basically, uh, you know, global politics, these prices can change very quickly and that has a significant effect. Um, the next step is estimating future vehicle prices. And so this we have a, a better handle on, although um, we do continue to kind of uh, be surprised by uh, announcements that are that are kind of uh, you know happening on battery prices and uh, vehicle prices. Next big step is to calculate the high level cost of service for um, electricity and then to um, look at the customer uh, bill revenue. And so this is um, you know th this again depends on the assumptions for each individual utility but um, is something that at least we have a, a, a better handle on. Um, so after we have those those elements then we construct scenarios for, let's say, infrastructure workout, uh, sorry, uh, rollout, um, external costs, and other elements of interest. So basically, um, each utility, uh, we work with each utility to define um, what scenarios they're interested in. And that'll, that'll of course, vary widely depending on um, the individual situation. Um, then the final step is to allocate costs and benefits based on the requirements of the um, the, these kind of standardized tests. And so um, next I'd like to talk about those, the total resource cost test and the um, ratepayer impact measure. And so um, these tests have been used for, for years in evaluating um, utility programs. Uh, they're not necessarily, let's say there, you know, there, there's certain imperfections, but, um, uh, you know, this is a, the, the, these are the, the tests, as, uh, as, as most utilities um, are expected to implement them to um, discuss costs. And basically what these, what these different tests do is they're looking at similar cost elements, but they're looking at it from um, different perspectives, uh, different stakeholder perspectives. And so the total resource cost test um, is essentially a very, um, you know, let's say it's a, it's a very high level stakeholder uh, basically, it's looking at all costs that are contributing um, to, you know, costs and benefits of an individual program and seeing what the effect is as a whole. So in some ways, it's kind of um, a societal view, but, but not quite, as I'll get into in a second. But in terms of what's considered in the total resources, uh, resource cost test, um, essentially incremental vehicle costs uh, are important. Um, Savings are important. So in this case, it's gasoline savings and the federal um, EV tax credit. Um, and then there's uh, cost of service, um, in particular um, infrastructure costs uh, or customer side infrastructure costs, um, e electric vehicle or sorry, uh, electricity costs, capacity costs, and T&D costs, and then um, the the net uh, greenhouse gas effects. Uh, the one. It, the, the one thing that, that isn't considered in this test, but is considered in a variation called the social cost test, are the other social effects like um, uh, the value of reducing petroleum consumption and um, the value of reducing emissions. And um, it, as I'll, well, I, I won't actually get into it too much, but um, we, we did not actually end up using the social cost test in general. And the reason why is that um, we, it was very difficult to obtain uh, uh, you know, let's say numerical data on the social impacts of um, emissions. And so, um, for instance, being able to say that each ton of um, NOx is worth, uh, you know, I don't know, a thousand dollars. It turned out to be very difficult to get that data um, in a way that was essentially um, uh, reliable and usable. And so those, th that didn't, that we, we didn't end up being able to, to do that social cost test. So we definitely recognize that, um, that, that, that those benefits are there, that there are reduced emissions. It's just that in terms of quantifying them, um, it's quite difficult. And actually EPRI is doing a, a, a work on this in California, um, which, which will take you know, approximately a year and a half to two years. Uh, but you know, what, what we kind of um, learned from this is that it's, it's quite, or you know, what, what, where we've learned, uh, what we've learned from where we're at right now is that it's, it's quite difficult. And so many of you may, may be familiar with our um, environmental study that we completed um, last year. 
And that does uh, get into the benefits of electric transportation, but doesn't quantify them numerically. So it's that, it's that numerical quantification that's um, quite difficult. The other um, big test that we used was the ratepayer impact measure. And so the stakeholder in this test is essentially a kind of theoretical um, ratepayer. And so um, in terms of the effects on that, on that theoretical ratepayer, essentially um, the, the monthly bill paid by a customer is the primary benefit. Um, and then uh, all of the costs of electricity service end up being the, the costs. Um, you'll see a little star there next to customer side infrastructure costs. And so um, for the ratepayer impact measure, essentially um, if you have, let's say, you know, $1,500 for installing um, a level two charger or EVSC for, for a vehicle, um, if that uh, EVSC is rate-based, then that does enter into the ratepayer impact measure. If it's not rate-based and it's, so it's provided by the customer themselves or some third-party supplier, it does not enter into the ratepayer impact measure. In all the cases we'll talk about um, today, th those costs are uh, not rate-based. Um, so how can we tell if these tests pass? Uh, essentially, there's, there, for each of the tests I'm going to present, there's going to be two columns. The left column is a benefit, uh, the right column is a uh, cost, and there's a, uh, let's say, empty box um, that represents the, the kind of um, net uh, uh, benefit cost uh, uh, equation. And so if that um, uh, uh, box is towards the top and, you know, essentially shows a, a, a gap or a a uh, positive gap between costs and benefits, then essentially this, the program is, um, the program's benefits are outweighing the costs. Sometimes that box will be below the um, x-axis or, yeah, x-axis, and that'll mean that there's, um, uh, that it's a negative result or that uh, costs are outweighing benefits. So for the first test, um, or for the first case, uh, your, you know, our question was, um, what are the effects of different charging locations? And so the reason we um, uh, are interested in this is that our general expectation is that away from home charging is gonna be more expensive to provision than at home charging. And so um, for, for most of the cases that we see kind of in the, in the world today, we believe this to be true. Um, you know, obviously these costs are, or our understanding of costs are constantly evolving, but in general, um, if someone can plug a, a vehicle in in their garage, um, and charge overnight, uh, we believe that the costs will continue to be um, lower over time. For the scenarios considered, um, that really we're, we're comparing the top and the bottom here. Um, the more home charging or the home charging focus um, had 80% uh, uh, home charging and 20% away from home charging. The more public charging had 20% home charging and 80% away from home charging. And so relative to what we're seeing in the market today, um, really we see, a, you know, we're, we're, we're seeing uh, much closer to the more home charging case. So 80%-ish home charging, 20% away from home charging. But um, as we, uh, you know, let's say as we look forward in time or we look to particular cases where let's say you have very low, um, you know, let's say if, if the customer or if the driver is not paying for workplace charging, they'll often, um, uh, you know, forego home charging to charge at work, um, or in, in cases where um, uh, home charging just simply isn't available, like um, uh, people who live in uh, dense cities uh, and park on the street, um, where we, we could see that 20% um, home charging, 80% away from home charging. So for the total um, resource cost test, um, starting over on the left-hand side, um, I think it's, it's worth spending some time to just talk about the different, different cost elements. Um, so the, the bottom, or, or, you know, over on the left-hand side, the bottom most box is the federal EV tax credit. And so basically this is offsetting um, incremental vehicle costs. Um, it, it ends up being, um, you know, important but relatively small. And the reason for this is that the, the time frame for this analysis is um, from, you know, approximately today till 2025. And um, we expect the, the federal tax credits to um, run out within, you know, about, uh, let's say two to three years for most of the automakers. 
Um, of course, uh, that tax credit could be extended, um, but at, at this point, we're we're not modeling that as a, uh, or we weren't modeling that in, in this. Um, so the, the biggest um, benefit is gasoline savings, and so that's the blue um, box uh, above that. And um, this this one's important uh, because essentially it's it's so large, and as I was mentioning earlier. Um, it's so uncertain and out of control of utilities. Um, and, you know, as I was saying, I wish there was a, you know, some, you know, I had something <laughs> better to say for this, like I knew where gasoline prices were going, but, um, you know, the reality is that, uh, that I don't, and as I'll get into it in a second, like even within 2016, we ended up being um, surprised on this. Uh, so this is, um, you know, just just a, a let's say a reality that we're going to have to face um, in in thinking about the future of the PEV market is that um, uh, factors outside of our control can have a very significant effect on on uh, the the benefit cost equation. The final um, cost is, which is um, you know ends up being quite small, is actually the greenhouse gas reductions, um, and you know this all comes down to your uh, the value of carbon you're using. In this case, we used, um, I think, you know, the, the the standard kind of social cost of carbon, and in that case, it ends up being um, a, a pretty small um, overall effect. In terms of costs, the, the primary cost is the incremental vehicle cost. So this is um, how much EVs cost relative to their um, internal combustion engine, um, let's say, comparisons. And it, that's a, a very significant cost that essentially, let's say, about offsets the um, gasoline costs. So um, this is um, something where uh, we we expect these costs to decrease over time, um, and, but we don't we don't. So in this case, we also the utilities um, also don't have control over this cost. But we expect it to be significantly more stable than let's say gasoline prices. The next uh, biggest cost element is the customer side infrastructure. Um, and so in general, as I, as I mentioned, we're, um, uh, we, we're modeling this as something that's not installed by the utilities, but it does end up being around. Um, in this case, the, 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 uh, the assumption varied, but it's, it's, it's around $2,000 per vehicle or, um, you know, around, yeah, somewhere around 15, I, I guess it was around, um, $1,500 per vehicle for um, a home charger and about $2,500 per vehicle for an away from home charger. And on top of that um, are the T&D costs, grid costs, and electricity um, energy costs. And so in general, um, all of those uh, electricity-based costs end up being relatively um, low in the overall uh, comparison with vehicle costs and, and gasoline costs. So, um, oh, you know, summing overall for the home charging focus, um, with all of these costs and benefits, we see about a 5% um, uh, net TRC benefit. And so, um, you know, th this is of course, uh, you know, highly subject to some, uh, or subject to some highly um, variable uh, cost and benefit elements, but, um, you know, it, 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 we, we do see a benefit, but, it, but at least I would say we see um, uh, you know, let's say a balance between benefits and costs. In terms of away from home charging, uh, moving to the right, uh, with increased um, uh, customer side infrastructure costs, uh, th that that um, balance ends up um, being negative. So there's about a six percent, um, you know, costs in this case are about six percent higher than benefits. Um, and in terms of the the uh, um, supplying that electricity, all, all of those elements that are related to the utility, um, as we'll see in the next slide, they, they do vary a bit, but they really don't end up varying all that much. Um, basically, you know, the, the, the cost of service is, um, you know, is relatively stable. So it's worth mentioning that we didn't um, consider some cases that would, that would significantly increase costs, like, base, you know, for instance, saying that um, all of these away from home uh, charging folks would be Charging at very high power, but um, if they're charging at you know let's say level two or rel you know relatively low power, um, those costs end up being about the same. Um, so you know it, it's never nice to see a, a, a negative cost in this, and so um, it's worth discussing that uh, briefly. Um, I would say that the the biggest um, uh, you know 
elements in this that, that, that would affect that balance back and forth are the um, gasoline costs. And in this case, um, the gasoline cost we used was $2.03 per gallon. And um, so towards the beginning of 2016, that, that was, you know, that was about um, what we were expecting. And actually when we, you know, it just so happened that when we were performing the study, when we were kind of finalizing these, um, these assumptions, uh, we were, you know, if you look at that, that uh, gasoline cost curve, it was basically a, you know, line just going straight down. Um, and in fact, you know, ended up going past uh, that, you know, $2-ish per gallon to uh, um, uh, about, you know, $1.85 or something like that at the national level. But, um, you know, of course, once we, you know, as usual, once you run all of the analyses and you, you know, you publish a report and you do all that kind of um, fun stuff, it just so happened that those, you know, that that, that, that when we did that analysis, that was a, you know, that was a, uh, the bottom of a, of a V. And so it immediately kind of pops back up and it turns out that today's price is about um, $2.32 a gallon, um, according to the EIA. So, or, you know, basically the same data source. And so that means that um, the gasoline costs relative to this are about 15% um, higher. Uh, however, it's worth noting that this, you know, that this, um, let's say blue bar, uh, it was not just a one-time um, uh, gasoline cost. It was a cost trajectory over the next um, 10 years or so. Um, but, um, you know, if you add in that 15%, uh, we would be back towards a beneficial, you know, cost, uh, benefit cost balance. Hey, hey Marcus, it's Ed. Um, we, we did get a question. So what was the time horizon used in the TRC test result? Yeah, so in this case, it was, it was, um, it, it's it's this is a uh, one of those things that's that's um, kind of difficult to to think about in some ways. What we did is we basically assumed that vehicles would be sold between now and 2025, um, and or actually you know uh, beginning of 2016 to 2025, um, and then we also included the benefits of uh, benefits and costs from 2025 to 2035. So essentially, as those vehicles you know that were sold in the 2025 timeframe. Um, go through their vehicle life, uh, those were included. So um, we're counting benefits and costs for 20 years, and we're assuming about um, 10 years of vehicle sales, if that makes All sense. Right, and, <clears throat> okay, good. And then we, we do have another question, too, is um, uh, we're not showing any grid benefits like ancillary services or avoided T&D costs uh, in the TRC, and the question is why? Yeah, that's right. Um, basically, we were, you know, this is this is more of a vanilla analysis. Um, that's definitely a side case that um, that I would be, you know, really interested in, in analyzing. Um, but what it would come down to is, can can we provide, um, you know, data that uh, could be fed into a model like this? And if we can, uh, definitely. I'd love to. Yeah, do and that. I think that I think that's an important point to you know all of the electric companies uh, online is. You know, the strength of the model gets greater as more and more data gets inputted into it. And uh, so, again, really encourage you that if you want to look at a local market situation with a greater level of granularity, then, you know, really encourage you to uh, engage with with EPRI on, uh, on that because, uh, you know, this has had to be developed at a relatively high level, but the model is very flexible to be able to handle uh, the input of uh, local market data. Yeah, it's worth noting that since the questioner asked about T&D costs in particular, um, the T&D costs in this were relatively low. I, I'm not sure on this scenario if, if we had zeroed them out or not, um, but in general for, you know, as I was mentioning, we were focusing on low power AC charging. Um, and this is one of those areas where, um, you know, as as, utility, or as the electric companies that have analyzed this um, would say, uh, you know, the costs can vary significantly depending on your assumptions. So um, very, very high power charging uh, could significantly change this balance or it, let's say increase T&D costs. Right. But in general, uh, we were, you know, um, we had relatively low T&Ds costs because the assumption was that, um, you know, adding a couple of chargers uh, doesn't really end up um, affecting the the, the 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 local part of the grid um, that much in the near term. So in terms of the, the rim test, um, 
this is where it, it gets interesting from for the ratepayer perspective, because um, basically you know, starting over on the on the left, um, in terms of benefits, the utility um, bills end up being you know the, the really the only benefit that's um, considered um, for the for the ratepayer, uh, and then the costs are the incremental cost of service or marginal cost of service. And in general, these these costs of service are, are relatively low because this this load is um, let's say not not particularly impactful. Like we're not um, it, you know generally not charging during the um, highest uh, uh, peaks of the year. So um, capacity costs uh, and other incremental costs are end up being relatively low. So in this case, the net rim benefit was about um, sixty percent for the home charging focus. And basically the same in the away from home charging focus. And the difference in this case is, as I was mentioning, there's a, a difference in commercial rates versus um, uh, residential rates. And, you know, there, there were some differences in those cost of service, but in general, they were, they were small, or, or let's say the differences were small. That, that, that marginal cost versus marginal benefit was basically about the same in both cases. Um, and so in terms of the RIM test, uh, you know, there are, um, uh, elements that are not considered in this test, like basically, you know, the, I would say the number one thing is, uh, let's say, overhead or you know, operating, <laughs> operating your companies. Um, but um, you know, th this, you know, so th this this test is not necessarily an end-all, be-all um, in terms of the the precise ratepayer impact. But this is the, um, you know, let's say the 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 standard kind of first step at um, looking at those effects. It ends up being quite positive, so about a sixty percent benefit. Uh, in the next case, um, what we looked about at were the effects of gasoline prices. So um, this was particularly interesting because of the um, the wide variability in gasoline prices, and of course the fact that it's it's something that's outside of the utility um, control. Um, so in terms of um, those gasoline prices, uh, if you look at the or if you're able to look at the um, uh, table at the bottom, uh, as I mentioned for the 20, 2016. Our gasoline um, cost assumption, uh, which came from the uh, the annual energy outlook, was two dollars and three cents, um, and then we used uh, fixed escalation rates in this case, um, basically for simplicity more more than anything. Um, and so those led to, let's say, um, just looking at the 2025 costs in the low gas price case, that ended up with um, you know cost increase of about 20 percent. Um, in the medium uh, case, it ended up being, uh, I guess, about a 40% adder. And in the high gasoline price case, um, it, it ended up doubling, you know, over doubling gasoline costs. Um, and it's, it's worth noting that these costs are in 2016 dollars. So, um, you know, basically be, be fixed relative to, the, to today. And in thinking about these costs, um, you know, it is possible that gasoline um, prices, you know, instead of let's say increasing by 20% by 2025, it's possible that they would decrease. So they would be, you know, uh, you know, <laughs> we'll we'll see uh, we'll see if it happens within uh, within my my lifetime again. But but it's it is um, theoretically possible for gasoline to go below a dollar a gallon, um, or you know, significantly above four dollars and and fifty odd cents per gallon. But um, this this range was uh, essentially came from the um, at the annual annual energy outlook, um, uh, you know, trajectories that they used. Um, so, is this uh, the right, you know, the exact right numbers? It's it's hard to say, but um, in general, or in the next slide, we'll look at the low price versus the high price. So that's about two dollars and forty cents in 2025 versus um, four dollars and fifty cents. So, in looking at these costs um, uh, in terms of uh, net benefits. Um, if we have low gasoline prices, so um, the, the the assumptions in this um, slide aren't precisely the same as before, but basically we had about a five percent um, cost benefit in the in the medium um, gasoline price scenario. So in this case, with low gasoline prices, we have about a negative fourteen percent um, net benefit. Uh, and so, um, you know, it's it's hard to say what that what that means exactly. Um, those prices are possible, so. Um, you know, continuing low gas prices are possible, but um, you know, it, yeah, I guess we'll we'll have to see <laughs> to some degree. But it, but basically, 
you know, in general, I mean, if you're if you're paying money for an asset and you're not really saving any money or saving as much money, um, you're not going to get as much benefit. However, in terms of the high gasoline cost, this was about four dollars and fifty, you know, fifty six cents a gallon, I guess, in 2025. Um, in terms of those high costs, the the net benefit in the TRC test um, is now about forty percent, um, and so you know those those costs of three dollar or sorry four dollars and fifty ish cents per gallon are you know ones that we've seen within the last couple of years. So um, you know I, I as I you know as I kind of joke uh, if I knew where the petroleum market was going I would be well, I'd be retired by now for sure. But uh, so I don't you know I don't I don't I can't say where where this is going. Um, but at a forty percent ish um, savings. In terms of gasoline costs versus um, vehicle costs or versus other costs, um, I think we would see you know significant transformation in the market. In terms of the rim tests, um, what what it, you know what may surprise people is that basically the you know the, those uh, very that variation in gasoline costs or the the costs we just talked about actually have no effect on the ratepayer impact um, it, at least as in the way that we modeled it um, for this. And the reason for that is that is that neither vehicle costs nor gasoline costs enter into that ratepayer impact. Um, so essentially, uh, you know, let's say to some degree, re regardless of what happens with that with the gas gasoline costs, um, we're not going to see an effect on on that on that ratepayer benefit of about uh, sixty percent. It's worth noting that there's there's a couple of caveats on this. You know, you know, I mentioned that this is relative to how we modeled it. So in this case, in terms of modeling, um, we did not model an effect of um, uh, petroleum costs on, let's say, uh, an indirect effect on um, electricity costs through a natural gas linkage. So it, it does happen that um, when petroleum uh, costs change, natural gas costs can change as well. Um, but we, you know, we generally believe that that linkage is relatively low, uh, but, but we modeled it as zero. So. It, there is a, a possible effect there. Um, and then the, the other big effect is that um, if we really had those high gasoline prices that um, changed the num you know significantly changed the number of vehicles, um, you would see changes here just due to um, increased utilization of uh, the electric or you know basically more vehicle sales and increased utilization of um, the grid. So that would, that would likely decrease costs um, further, although you know of course without modeling it, it's hard, hard to say for sure. But I guess it's worth noting that um, this again is is one of those cases where um, we're, we're dependent to some degree on the um, on the scenarios that uh, that you know our, our participants wanted to find and the assumptions that are available. Um, let's say, for instance, on that you know that linkage between petroleum prices and electricity prices. You, you know, we we know that something exists, or we believe that something exists, but. Um, Coming up with a precise number, and let's say you know one that's especially defensible, is um, quite difficult. So, in terms of a high-level summary, um, you know, basically there's many factors that affect these uh, these comparisons, um, but the two big ones are uh, gasoline prices and the vehicle prices. Um, so, the falling battery costs are going to make this comparison more favorable over time. Um, I was just looking again at the uh, vehicle costs today. And um, relative to what we're seeing in the market in terms of the, the recent um, battery electric vehicle announcements, um, I would say that the, that the vehicle costs we use are, are comparable to what we're seeing today. Um, but, you know, we've, you know, let, let's say I've been surprised uh, many times on um, costs. Like, let's say General Motors, uh, I guess it was about six months ago. You know, basically announced um, their battery cost for the Bolt, and they essentially blew all of the models that we had out of the water. So, um, you know, you can't don't necessarily know if we're going to get uh, you know a lot more announcements like that that are um, that are you know, let's say game changing. But um, you know, as I've said, I've been surprised many times and uh, expect to be in the future. Uh, in general, though, regardless of like these these uh, vehicle costs and um, uh, gasoline costs, uh, there are a potential for significant ratepayer benefits. Um, and we believe that this is true across the country. Um, you know, of course, you know, we, you know, I guess what every 
what every modeler says is, uh, yeah, we need to model that one too. Uh, <laughs> um, we, we would want to do, you know, before being too definitive, it's important to, to analyze the cost in different cases, but with, with somewhere around a 60% um, cost benefit uh, or, you know, net, net benefit, um, we believe that those findings are, are likely to be robust. Um, and, you know, definitely um, would, would like to uh, consider alternative cases like, um, you know, very high power charging and, and so on. But um, you know, need need to develop assumptions for that and uh, uh, work with stakeholders on that. In terms of thinking about um, utility program design, um, the main difficulty we encountered in this, um, in in thinking about this, is basically estimating the effect of a utility program on the market. So basically, we expect that something like um, customer education would lead to more vehicle sales. Um, or installing um, infrastructure would lead to more vehicle sales, but quantifying that precisely is is quite difficult. And so um, we we actually uh, are in in the midst of um, launching a new project to basically uh, uh, try to let's say try try to at least get an initial estimate of this. So use um, uh, customer modeling and um, survey work to be able to figure out uh, what the effects of these programs are going to be. It's um, an another big um, difficulty we had is that, um, it, you know, we really wanted to include the magnitude of these social costs. So basically, uh, we know that, uh, you know, we, we know from our environment study that we're going to um, decrease emissions, uh, decrease pollutants, you know, uh, let's say criteria pollutants in particular, so the ones that lead to um, air quality impacts. So we're, we strongly believe that, but um, in terms of, uh, uh, coming up with an analysis that can put a you know a precise dollar amount to that that is um, you know you know widely defensible uh, that's that's quite difficult to do and I think you know we're we're, we're certainly not the first um, people who have encountered this problem but um, it's it's um, you know it, it it is a difficulty when you're really not able to quantify one of your one of your important benefits and so this is something we're also um, working towards but uh, you know this is um, you know, something that's been tried, tried for years, and uh, you know, it, it, it's we're never gonna we're never gonna get um, uh, something ultra precise, but just getting something that's um, defensible is it would be very important. And that's um, all I had. I, I'm looking forward to questions. Uh, it's worth noting that um, the full report is available uh, online. It's publicly available um, at that link, which. Um, you know, often it's easier to just go into Google and enter in the EPRI report number, but um, you know, it's there if you need it. And uh, uh, my email address is at the bottom, malexander at epri.com, and I'd definitely be happy to discuss the um, uh, report in more detail. And uh, I would love to uh, discuss it now. Great. <clears throat> Thanks. Thanks, Marcus. So, um, Nick, you want to say something? I was just going to say, just before we go into some, the Q and A, what I'm going to do now is um, is unmute the audience, so that folks have the opportunity to unmute themselves if they need to ask a question over the phone. We'd really appreciate a heads up through the question Q and A field, if you if you don't mind, before you do that, so that we can try to moderate this. We still got over sixty line sixty people on the on the meeting, but um, again, you can. We're going to unmute the audience, and so you'll you should be able to unmute yourselves uh, manually, either through the computer or by hitting star six on your phone. So go ahead, Ed. Great. Um, so you know, I'll kick it off, and uh, we're obviously monitoring to see if we get some uh, audience questions as well. But so, Marcus, you know, I, I guess uh, you know the first question I'd have is that these findings today are, I think, primarily around light-duty passenger vehicles. So the question would be, do you see these same kind of ratepayer benefits um, generally apply to other uh, transportation sectors like um, goods movement or transit? So we generally think that that would be true, but um, there are uh, cases where, where where that wouldn't be true, and in particular for the for the transit question, um, you know, we're we're certainly not against uh, what what different companies are doing, but um, some companies are um, you know pushing towards uh, very high power charging, 
and um, you know basically be high power, low duration. And you know, so the, the cost numbers that we have here would not apply in that case. Like this, this is for um, you know, let, let's say relatively low power charging. Like let's you know, approximately overnight or in the commercial case, it was or the away from home charging case, it was during the day. Um, if you you know, if, if you have um, let's say a forklift, it's likely to be somewhere around this range. If you have something that's that's very high power. Um, it would likely push up costs, uh, and, and of course, um, the the um, rate uh, income would stay about the same. So the that the net benefit would go down significantly. Right. So I mean, <clears throat> this is certainly, I think, an is issue for unknown all participant is now exiting. Uh, for uh, all electric companies to really have a seat at the table. Um, and it goes very much back to that original slide that I put up of, of uh, you know, being proactive or, you know, waiting for the market to come to you. And, you know, I think this issue of faster and faster charging is, you know, going to need electric company participation because there are certainly things that third parties can do or customers can do to mitigate the impacts um, as opposed to just simply saying, well, you know, it's uh, the job of the grid to take care of it or the job of ratepayers to take care of it. So I think certainly I'd be, you know, interested in thoughts uh, on folks uh, on the line around this whole issue of, you know, faster and faster charging and its implications when it comes to uh, ratepayers. So, uh, Marcus, just, um, you know, moving on. So do you think <clears throat> do you think regulators kind of get this this notion that um, the EVs are kind of a good thing for the grid or a good thing for all ratepayers? Um, our our, ta our take in uh, you know working with various um, electric companies is is basically that um, uh, you know it varies across the country. Of course, in in California, the 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 regulators are quite engaged. Um, I would say in a lot of places there's still, um, you know, relatively low level of awareness about uh, electric vehicles, and um, I would say there's there's often a sense that, um, you know, this this is not really real yet, and uh, and in some cases that's that's appropriate, um, you know, given very very low sales in some states, uh, but. You know, in general, there's there's a lot of education that's going to have to happen about, um, in in many cases, about where we're at, and as the market evolves, um, we're certainly going to have to, you, you know, uh, f figure out what that means for for um, utilities in states where where sales aren't particularly high right now, and we're going to have to figure out how to how to educate um, uh, those regulators about, uh, you know, let's say the evolving market. Right. Um, so, so when you think about the, the that you know regulators that are kind of considering these programs, and again, I think it's important to stress that there's not one size that fits all for all electric companies and all all markets in terms of the role of the electric company. You know, it could be as simple as just uh, facilitating a smooth, cost-effective, uh, customer-friendly connection to the grid to kind of educating customers on um, how to connect seamlessly to the grid all the way up to, um, you know, facilitating deployment of infrastructure. So it's not, it's not just one, uh, you know, one solution. But I think that, Marcus, as uh, the regulators kind of consider this, uh, the, these programs that, that uh, electric companies may want to push for, you know, what do you think they're, the, the biggest challenges they have with it? Um, you know, definitely the big one is, is just figuring out what that utility role is. Um, we've seen this in California for, for sure where uh, the, the, the regulatory stance went from um, the, the utilities basically having no role uh, to having, a, you know, to being very engaged. I mean, be, being engaged in different um Different ways, depending on the, the three different IOU programs. But Harry Logan uh, is now exiting. Definitely um, changing that. Um, in terms, though, of uh, you know of other of other parts of, across the country or other areas in the country, um, you know, there's there's definitely a lot of a lot of variation in what the utility role is today in, in other areas. 
And so um, as we move towards, you know, transportation electrification, it's it, it, some some utilities are going to have um, a lot of latitude. Some of them are not going to have um, much at all. And uh, so figuring out what that role is, is is still, you know, way up in the air, very uncertain. Right. Hey, uh, Ed and, and Marcus, we got a couple of questions, one from Kel and one from Eli. Uh, if either of you guys want to unmute yourselves, you're welcome to do so and, and, and talk directly to Marcus and, and Ed. Otherwise, I'm happy to read the questions. Um, okay, so for, for Kellen, he's asking, is there any ability through these cost-benefit tests to link the impact of, for example, DC fast chargers added to a market that then drive EV adoption, but most of that additional electricity usage occurs at home? That's a great question, and that's... Um, yeah. Oh, sorry, was, that, was there more to the question? No, I was just laughing because I agree it's a very good question. Yeah. <laughs> well, and so, um, as I mentioned, um, this is the program that we're, or project that we're essentially working to, to launch um, now. And, and I would say, you know, probably would, would kick off towards the beginning of next year, um, is trying to figure out, or trying to get it, to get an initial um, estimate of the effects of, let's say, having more DC fast charging. Um, so basically trying, um, in general, uh, I would say that this is something that EPRI hasn't really done in the past. I think most utilities haven't really done in the past, but, um, you know, kind of going beyond the meter and, and thinking about, um, you know, what, what factors drive customer adoption. Uh, we, we haven't really worked in that before, but uh, um, in general, you know, let's say within EPRI, there's been a lot of interest in doing that for um, solar PV and for other end use applications. And so what the electric transportation program is doing is, um, leveraging that work to try and figure out, um, you know, what, what these factors are. So basically, just figuring out, like, um, is, you know, there have been there have been various surveys and studies that 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 could say, um, you know, let's say we know that having fast charging is important, but in terms of being able to say, like, what what the, you know, a what an estimate of that precise impact is is quite difficult, and so mm -hmm. uh, we're working to do that. So, to, I mean, I, I don't want to, I don't want to speak for Kellen, but another another way of looking at this is, can DC fast chargers be considered almost a consumer education investment in the same way that you, you know, electric companies make investments in education about energy efficiency and such? Yeah, that's a, that's a great way to put it. But I would say there's two elements to that. One one is that that's that is a great way to put it in terms of what the utilities could do. Um, the other is that. Uh, with these, you know, we'll, we'll see, um, you know, how some of these things like the the, the VW uh, settlement um, end up, you know, fully, let's say, what, what happens when everything um, fully occurs. But uh, there's, a, there's a number of programs that essentially are, um, let's say, building uh, um, uh, infrastructure, building DC fast charging infrastructure in particular, outside of the involvement of the utilities. And so, you know, even if the utility uh, wasn't able to install it themselves. They should at least be able to. Un they should at least understand what the effects of someone else doing it will be. Well, and they might even be able to influence where it gets put to, you know, minimize the the upstream implications. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's I mean, that's again. It speaks to, you know, you, you either have a seat at the table or you're on the menu. And I think that's that's something in all of this. This market is changing rapidly, and uh, this one issue alone, I think, it behooves all of us to be actively engaged with the third parties to to really mitigate as much as we can these upstream implications. So we got a we had another question from Eli um, Morris. I'm not sure if Eli, you want to unmute yourself and ask it directly, or I can. I'm happy to read it. Um, Okay, so what, what Eli asks is, the analysis shows that EV adoption can decrease rates, but doesn't touch on whether the utility should be investing ratepayer funds to stimulate adoption. This is kind of, this sounds similar to Kellen's question. Has any work been done to try to draw a direct link between utility expenditures and increased adoption? Ah, yes. <laughs> or let's say that that's what we're working towards. Um, and, and I would say that, that you know, we, if, if uh, I know I've noticed from the uh, 
participants on the call that um, a, a number of the a number of the participants have been uh, you know long term uh, you know members of the electric transportation program at EPRI, and I would say um, you know this is something that's kind of been been bubbling along for years, uh, but definitely out of this work that was that was one of the things that that, that was that was apparent is that basically um, if you can't if you can't show that linkage in a way that's that's defensible, um, then you know, as he said, um, or as he said, uh, it, it you can't really let's say design a program or think about what um, what utilities should do. In general, of course, you know, EPRI doesn't really due to due to our role, um, uh, you know, as a scientific nonprofit and so on. We don't really make recommendations about what utilities should do, but we we uh, would very much like to help utilities. Um, who who have ideas uh, analyze the effects of their ideas. Um, while we wait for other questions, uh, I had a question for you about some of the assumptions that went into the model. Um, you know, there's clearly a difference in cost between public and you know home, as you say, home charging focus away from home charging focus. How did you figure out what you think customers would be willing to pay for away from home charging focus? Um, in this case, we didn't we didn't actually look at willingness to pay. Um, we just basically assumed that they were going to do it, um, and that's uh, you know that's uh, uh, questionable to to some degree. But basically, um, you know what we're saying is if they do it, um, what would the effects be? Mm -hmm. Not necessarily that um, that you know that they that they will do it. And, yeah. and you know as I mentioned, um, what you know what we're seeing, which. Uh, which you know, I think everyone who's worked in this for a long time is, is um, you know, what we what we all kind of expected, which is basically um, people are charging at home when they when they can. Um, the you know, as I mentioned, uh, let's say the the Idaho National Lab studies and other studies that we've seen indicate somewhere around um, you know eighty percent of charging is happening at home, and um, that's you know that that is great, but uh, um, as the market moves forward, there's there there will be a larger number of um, Customers who are not able to charge at home, mm -hmm. either because um, you know they they live in a multi-unit dwelling, or they park on the street, or um, you know they just basically I don't know don't, <laughs> their garage is full. <laughs> yeah. Um, so so th this the, the the in this case it's looking at what what happens when when that occurs, not necessarily that um, that they're going to want to. So so what did you guys end up using though, just for a you know just for my own information about the kilowatt hour charge? Oh, in terms of each each uh, charge, uh, yeah. good question. I'd have to I'd have to go back and look that up because it, okay. it varies on the um, vehicles. But essentially, it would be um, kind of like the you know let's say the generic numbers that we generally use were, were about twelve thousand miles per year mm -hmm. um, are, are driven by uh, you know most vehicles. And so an electric vehicle would um, use about that much, and so that would be you know thinking out loud, it'd be somewhere around three thousand kilowatt hours a year, probably thirty five hundred kilowatt hours mm -hmm. per year. Yep. Um, and then, and then a PHEV. We we also did have PHEVs in this model, and um, you know they they would use uh, less obviously. So mm -hmm. in the case of the PHEV ten, I think it would be, you know, a bit less than a thousand per year. So I don't, I don't know what the average would be for um uh, for the full vehicle fleet. Mm -hmm. That's a good question. So Nick, do we have another question? Yes, yes we do. Uh, this one's from Gloria, and it, she asks in terms of f fast charging. What's the impacts of AC fast charging versus DC fast charging on the ratepayer Backing benefits? Off, EEI. Is now exiting. <laughs> yeah, uh, so um, in, in this case, what we'd have to do is talk about what um, what fast charging means. And so I'd be curious about uh, where, what the questioner, or, where, where, you know, the perspective of the questioner, because in general, um, with the way that, uh, let's say, light duty at least is, is arranged right now, um, uh, you know, when we when we talk about DC fast charging, we're generally talking about um, a, you know 50 kilowatts and above. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, nowadays people are scared, scary. People are talking about 350 kilowatts. Um, so <laughs> um, you yeah. know that that's definitely on the fast charge side. On the AC side, it it is theoretically possible um, to have charging at that level. And in fact, you know the um, uh, let's say the SAE. I think it's the SAE standard. You know, it has a it has a placeholder in there for AC fast charging, but basically, right now, no one is no one is really talking about going above about um, 20 kilowatts, mm -hmm. and even that would be very unusual. So for the for the AC side, the fastest 
is generally in the range of you know 10 kilowatts yeah um, however uh you know in terms of something like a bus um you know we're all we also participate in those areas and so um let's say cer certain companies in particular uh favor high power ac charging and so that could be multiple you know it could be 200 kilowatts or something of ac charging so i'm not sure if, if she was asking about that precisely um but in terms of um you know let's say let's say this kind of vanilla um level two you know 10-ish kilowatt charging versus um you know 50 to let's let's call it 100 kilowatt dc charging so we, we do know that there's going to be um significantly higher costs for the for the DC um, uh, charging on a per charger basis. However, in terms of the vehicle fleet, um, it, it's it's uncertain or it would depend on how much that, that ends up getting used because the way that, um, that we kind of conceive of the market right now is that uh, DC fast charging would be um, would be you know important for how people think about electric vehicles, but uh, relatively rarely used. So basically, you you would use it for long trips, and you know perhaps if um, you know if you were uh, you know you had a level or you, you had low power charging at home, and you you just needed to basically recharge a battery, but you would, you'd be using that probably a couple times a month, um, something in that range. Uh, you know, obviously very dependent on the on the personal driving pattern. But um, so what that would mean is that on a per vehicle basis, the effects would be you know somewhere um, comparable. Um, to AC charging, mm -hmm. but again, on a on a per charger basis. Um, so you know, in terms of the, you know, the the thing that you you park at, um, that effect's going to be quite a bit bigger. And um, in particular, you know, one one of the things that we're also um, you know working on at Epri is just figuring out what 350 kilowatt charging really means, um, because so far, you know, in, in terms of thinking about costs and and, and so on, we really haven't. <laughs> We really haven't thought that anyone would go to that level. <laughs> so, uh, um, you know, as I said, we're we're always uh, we're always being surprised. Uh, hopefully, in this case, it's a positive surprise, but certainly, certainly, a pretty big cost. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, I think we're we're uh, pretty close to the end here, Nick. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I just maybe one final question to Marcus, and that is, so Marcus. You know, where do you go from here, right? What what's what's kind of next on the 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 list from your perspective? Yeah, great question. So um, definitely the big one is um, is this kind of uh, customer modeling and trying to come up with an estimate for um, uh, w what effect uh, you know various uh, electric electric company programs would have. Um, and then the other big one is is looking at uh, trying to um, figure out the emissions effects or the, you know the air quality effects and, and how to monetize those. And in particular, you know most mostly what we covered today was um, light duty, but in particular for uh, medium duty and um, uh, non road and heavy duty, um, this is going to be important because uh, you know again you know talking about surprises, um, one of the one of the big ones to us is that the bus market, um, the transit bus market, is emerging as a, um, you know, you know, one where uh, just just on a on a basically simple cost basis, um, buses, uh, you, you know, have the have the have a real potential to be electrified at a, at a very large number in the near term, and so um, thinking about the effects of the of the, of the emissions reductions is going to be, uh, you know, important as an adder. Right. All right, great. Look, um, Nick, I'll hand it back to you. But uh, I think we, we covered a lot of ground today. As I said, you know, at the very beginning, it's a it's a really dry subject. Uh, very much appreciate everybody hanging in there. Hopefully, uh, this was helpful. And again, is now I encourage exiting. encourage everybody to um, you know reach out to us through Nick um, and uh, Marcus to uh, you know follow up with questions that you might have. So Nick, over to you. Yeah, thanks very much, Ed. Thanks, thanks, Marcus. Uh, thanks, EEI and DOE for for sponsoring this effort. Uh, we Is really appreciate exiting. everybody's time. Uh, we'll we'll be posting the slides and the video online uh, within the next few days, and we'll be in touch about next steps with the series. Again, thank you, everybody, and uh, have a good day. Thanks.